Last week I showed you some cauliflower, which is unusual as considering how hot it's been. And now this is some of that cow shot lettuce, which is that new variety we brought on. And um, if there was any questions about it being heat tolerant, it for sure is. Um, now I do got some that's starting to bolt a little bit and you can see that's get, yeah. getting there, but uh, and, and I think the in the fall and cooler parts of the year, the heads would certainly get much bigger than this. But well, you know, the product pictures we got looks a little different than that. It's got the red tip with the green leaf. Yeah, and I don't know if the heat maybe expressed the red color more. I would say or, so. Or uh, it was just a nutrient deal, but... Um, that is a romaine. Yeah, so it's a red romaine. And had our temperatures been normal, I think these would have... Uh, come off a lot better but considering what we dealt with I was able to salvage a decent little uh, well, that's nice for this time of the year now sometimes they'll get bitter in this hot weather what you think that's not... yeah. probably make a pretty good little BLT there it would. so not the most massive heads of lettuce I've ever grown but uh, you know I like remains and one thing I like about let me touch on this one thing I like about remains is it's up it's upright growth stays clean stays cleaner and you don't have to wash near as much dirt off of it so I'm a big fan of the remains well we ain't had nary rain to splash any dirt up on no, it to start with no, no. Um, but I've been babying this pretty good with the drip and um, hey you take what you can get sometimes That's right. Let's say hey to everybody. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Row by Row Gardening Show. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And we've got a really good show planned for you tonight. So excited that you're joining us. We're going to talk sweet potatoes tonight because it's that time of year to plant sweet potatoes. And um, so we're going to go through, you know, varieties, planting strategies, even some fertilization um, methods yep. for sweet potatoes. I read somewhere where somebody said, that there's three things that loves this heat we've been having. Mm -hmm. Okra, sweet potatoes, and weeds. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of truth to that. Okra and sweet potatoes absolutely love this weather we've been having. Yeah, they do. They do. I'll show you something else that likes this weather we've been having. Um, hmm. So, these are my zinnias here we've been harvesting. My wife's been harvesting these things and keeping the house nice now, and what, pretty. Now, which variety is this one? That's the lime. Well, that is, I haven't grown that one. That's the one that. you said you didn't like, I thought. No, no, no. The one I don't like is, 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 is another one. I so you do like that one? I do now. like you that one. You change your mind. Yeah, I do like that. There's another one that, that's, that's got more red in it that I don't, that don't that fades too bad on me. Oh, uh, okay. So this is the white. You can put them upside, you can kind of see. Mm -hmm. Cause in some, hey, in some light, the white kind of looks a little bit green. But yeah. So that's the white, and you get a few of them in the mix, but not a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And then the lime, you don't get that one in the mix. That is a... Um, that's a straight straight lime, ain't it? Yeah. And um, so still plenty of time to get them zinnias in the ground. Uh, you just planted some more, didn't you? I did. I got sunflowers and zinnias coming on, man. I just planted me a big patch of them. My, my giant hybrid sunflowers, and I think it may have had to do with the heat. I just couldn't keep enough water on them. They didn't get 14 foot tall like you I had them. Mm -mm. No. I had them beside my sun hemp. Yeah. I planted a cover crop. Yeah. Uh, they, can, they got about eight foot tall. Yeah. And they're blooming now, and I had a bunch of little bee bees all over them this mm -hmm. morning. Um, I need to give an update on corn. Okay. I've been in the corn patch all afternoon. We've been uh, getting corn. Now this here, what you wanted me to grow this year was just honey. Select. Select. And that's what, I'm What's about halfway through it. Now you eat a, last week on the show, you eat a whole ear raw. Yeah, but now. And we I, had some folks complaining about that. Oh, really? Yeah, they was upset. Said well, we got, crunching on that corn. And I'm, I, I'm going to straighten a little bit of that out to date. And I'm going to tell you, I don't like this honey select. Really? And I know you don't want to hear that, but it's the fact that I'm not going to grow it no more. It was your idea for me to grow it this time. And I grew it, but I, I will not be growing the honey select again. It's not my type of corn. It's too sweet. Too sweet. Now this right here, what she's doing, she's cutting this off. Miss Hoss did that? She's cutting this off. Now she she boiled the, the cob, and then she cuts it off, and she puts a little butter in there. And then it's just like this right here. And I'm going to tell you, that's not like corn I'm used to eating. If I wanted to eat sugar, I'd go buy me a bowl of candy. 
Yeah. They don't have that flavor like corn's got. It's just too sweet. I know some people like it. I got a neighbor down the street named Eddie. Eddie comes up here every day. I'm going to get me three years of corn. I look at him, he's got an arm loaded. And he says it's the best corn he's ever eaten. But I don't think Eddie's understanding what corn's supposed to taste like. Yeah. Now, I, I will, uh, if you don't mind there, let me try a little bite of that. Pretty good. It's too sweet. Um, it, it, I borrowed some and cooked it on the cob. I mean, I thought it was some of the best corn I've ever well, had. Well, I've heard several people say that, but the fact of the matter is y'all don't know what corn's supposed to taste like. If well, you grew up like I did, eating uh, Silver Queen, you and, got you, on your lip, and right? you had plenty of it coming up yourself, you ought to know what it tastes like, or field corn, then you know corn has got that starchy flavor to it. And it's not real, real sweet. Then this here is way too sweet. If if you want to, if you've been growing those silver queens and have those tastes like I got, where you like that corn flavor, and you want it to kick it up just a notch, you need to grow their ambrosia. Or the incredible. Or, or the incredible. They are a little bit sweeter than the silver queens. If you wanted to change up a little bit, I love the silver queen. But this right here, this triple sweet stuff, you can have. I'm not gonna grow no more of it. See, I, I'm a big fan. I'm actually gonna grow some in the fall. Right towards late August, I'm gonna plant me some. I really like it. Well, but, a lot uh, of people do, but y'all don't know what corn is supposed to taste like. Well, and that's that's a good. Uh, that's a. Um, Here's the problem: they have bred these corns and things like that for this newer generation, because everybody wants everything sweet, and and you don't know what corn. Is. Now you're getting into a whole philosophical discussion you about yep. generations and don't know what uh, everything has been. These major corporations have furnished. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what corn's supposed to taste like. You take field corn. There's very few people out there anymore to eat field corn. I love roast ears, but it don't taste like candy. Like it's right here, it tastes like corn. Yeah. Anyway, I, I'm going to open up, but I ain't growing no more of this. I do not like it. <laughs> it doesn't seem like you have too big a problem no, with it. Like it. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, my incredible corn is getting pretty close. And uh, I ain't going to have a bumper crop, but a uh, decent crop. And we'll have to try some of that on the show. That's probably more towards um, your avenue on what you like there. Mm -hmm. I got my peppers. Of all the things in my dream garden that didn't, haven't turned out so well, boy, my peppers are looking fine. They're so green, they almost black. They're looking good, and they starting to put on. Well, that's good. I like a good roasted. It pepper almost stuff. got me thinking that my soil is pro probably too acidic, where those pine trees were. Peppers like acidic soils, uh, from what I understand. Really? Um, hmm. It doesn't make any sense why the peppers would be thriving so much, and the tomatoes and some of the other stuff wouldn't. I'm be. gonna have to work with you on the tomatoes. Now you have to admit, I'm a good tomato grower. You are, you I'm are, and I have yourself. never claimed to to be great at growing tomatoes. I, I always just salvage a few here and there. I'm gonna work with you on that. I had I have little, um, of all of mine, the Cherokee purples seem to be doing the best of all of my tomatoes. Surprisingly, mm. I had a little burr. Little blossom end rot, that's code bird, bird is what we call it. Um, on a few of my early ones, but I think it's worked its way I out of there. I haven't had any of that. And speaking of that, on the blossom end rot, because we've had a lot of people ask, um, it, and we could probably do a whole show on this. It's not just whether the calcium's there, it's where it has a lot to do whether it's available for uptake by the plant and not, and not on that but it has to do with movement too right so if if it if it can't be taken up by the plant it don't matter how much you put there so there's a lot of complicated things that go into it they are and we should probably cover that on a whole nother show now, I, get kind yeah of we will we'll cover that because I, I have i got a pretty good system to take take care of that and we need to cover it. that's not gonna be a whole show whole show yep what else is going on? Uh, we're supposed to finally get some rain this weekend. A heap of it. 90% were. Last time I checked, it was 90% Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and 80% Monday. Mm -hmm. If it rains that much. And I, I hope it comes in slow because what happens is when you get dry and the ground gets hard, it's if you get a bunch at one time, it just washes there's away. Fan, there's a fancy word for that when your soil get, won't take water up. What's that? Hydro something or other. <laughs> but your soil actually gets like, now you've seen this happen before. You pour water on something, it just rolls off of it. 
Your soil will get to that at a certain now, stage. Now, it'll fill the ponds up, but it won't yeah. do, do much yeah. for your garden. It won't. So, hopefully we get some of that rain coming in. And the last thing I want to mention, because I talked to um, a fella on the phone about this last week. Them gold prize squash, I believe, is the makingest, and that's a word meaning they make a lot. Mm -hmm. The makingest squash I have ever seen. I've been well satisfied with mine. I talked to a, another fella, and he said he can't believe how much they putting on he said he's been growing squash a long time so i got me another row planted that's about this tall still plenty of time even if you live in the deep south to probably squeeze in one more yeah. crop of squash I got some more coming up myself and if you didn't do the gold prize the first time i can promise you keep those plants healthy it will make and make and make and make yep um you've got a little what's that that row would probably ain't 15, 20 foot long. Yeah, something like that. We've been picking sure. over a five gallon bucket about every other day. I'm a good squash grower. Good squash grower. We had some folks commenting on how big squash plants mm -hmm. were, how pretty they look. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's get into today's big topic, which is sweet potatoes. And uh, I've got a, I planted mine this past weekend. And I've got a sweet potato video coming out next week. And uh, we want to kind of go over varieties, how we plant them. Yeah, everybody's commenting. They got their some of their squash and other things coming off, and they got these extra patches laying out there they want to do something with. But you pretty much got three choices besides trying to sneak in another squash and rotation. Okra, sweet potatoes, or cover crops at this point. Or flowers. Or flowers, yeah. Um, now, I did have somebody, I think it was on the Road by Road group, asking about... Should they, they had a little spot in their garden, should they plant sweet potatoes there? I will tell you, don't, if you, don't try to squeeze them in too tight a spot because they'll end up getting wild on you and smothering out some other stuff. So give them plenty of room. Give them plenty of room or else you're going to be in there cutting vines. And um, if you, let me say something about sweet potatoes, put your drip underneath them. That is a great insurance policy. May or may not need it, but if you put it there as hot and dry as it can get this time of the year, it's a good way to salvage the crop if it turns off dry. Let's talk about varieties real quick, and then we'll get into uh, kind of growing needs. So we've tried several of them from a uh, steel plant company, which is where we get our slips from, mm -hmm. sweetpotatoplant.com. Um, the, there's... There's some, we're going to just talk about the kind of orange flesh traditional sweet potatoes. Well, you know, you wonder how many varieties of the sweet potatoes there are. There's a bunch of them. Would you like to know? Sure, go ahead. There's over 6,500 varieties of sweet potatoes. Wow. There's a lot of varieties, of, uh, Asian varieties, and uh, over there across the pond, there were a lot of different ones over there that we've never seen before. Mm hmm I'm glad you don't like that corn. I ain't growing it no more. <laughs> So um, the ones we've tried, and these are just the orange ones. We don't talk about the white ones or the purple ones. But the, the Beauregard we've tried, which is probably, uh, and this is regional. We've talked to folks in other parts of the country where some varieties do better than others. And, but for us, the Beauregard was probably the, our least favorite. We, it's one of the newer say. varieties out there. And everybody I've talked to says it's the easiest potato to grow. It has the lowest fertility requirements, and it was the most forgiving. However, it just wasn't good to me. Now, it was we grew up making a good crop of them, but they just didn't have the flavor to them that I expected. And then, um, then you got the Centennial, mm -hmm. which we did okay with. And then um, the one that had done the best for us so far perennially was the Covington. Exactly. Uh, nice. Number lots of number ones. You want to tell them what number mm -hmm. one? Number one is a perfect tater. Nice big tater like you see in the store. Mm -hmm. I had a guy the other day, a buddy I grew up with, come over here and we was talking sweet potatoes. He got talking about pin potatoes, and I never heard it taught that. But that's where your vine runs out and pins down and makes a smaller potato out there. I thought he was talking about them long, skinny ones mm -hmm. you get on the outside. He was talking about where that vine pins down out there and it'll make a tater out there. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. I had never heard that either. Yeah. Um, there's another variety. Steel's got another orange variety I've never tried. They call it a bush variety called Vardaman. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know anything about that one. I don't either. I did read a little bit on it, but I, I, that's foreign to me. 
And then we got the Georgia Jet, which is the one we're trying this year. Hand us those, uh, hand me those slips over there, or that cup. We've been keeping these in water. We didn't plant these right off the get go. Um, so the Georgia Jet was recommended to us by Larry and Ken over there at Steel. And it's supposed to be, according to their website, the fastest growing one. Um, of course, that ain't a big deal to us. We got plenty of time. Yeah, but for the most part, you can figure on 100 days. 100 days of material to sweet potatoes. I have left them in there 120 days. Yeah. Just depending on if, when I get the itch to dig them or not. Let's talk about what kind of soils they like. Um, sweet potatoes, just like Irish potatoes, even though they're not related, they like the sandy, well-drained soils. They need some water, but they don't need a heap of water. They uh, like hot, sandy soils. That's right. Uh, the optimal soil pH is going to be somewhere between 5.8 to 6.2, so r relatively acidic, not too much. Mm -hmm. um, and then I did read where it said that's to... The last just terrible, wasn't it? Right, good wasn't no good. <laughs> the uh, that you want to avoid grassy areas or idle areas. So you don't want to take a area that you hadn't grown a garden in in years or maybe never, turn it over and go right in with some sweet potatoes. They're not going to like that. They they're going to do better in an established garden spot. Um, it also said not to plant them in an area where you might have had some nematode problems. So you want to keep them rotated with your okra and your other stuff that you might encounter some nematode issues. Okra is notorious for nematodes. That's right. That's right. We can knock that out with some of them cover crops. So um, plant these in your established garden. Don't make a new garden for sweet potatoes because they probably ain't going to do as well. You there. know, the fertility requirements really shocked me on this. I thought I knew how to grow sweet potatoes. I did not understand the exact nutri recommended nutrient requirements for these. Yeah, and we're about to talk about that. These are uh, these are slips, and a lot of people grow their own slips. I don't ever have any sweet potatoes left over to make slips from. We put these in water. These are looking pretty, and uh, I've got a few that didn't make it. I'm probably gonna go in and replace with these guys here. Fertility on sweet potatoes. Yeah, th now this is a whole different ball game than most things we grow. It is. So let's talk about, um, I made a few cards if you don't Ooh, mind. Card. I love cards. Okay, so here's our fertility requirements and I broke it down as always to pounds per thousand square feet. So we got nitrogen, we got phosphorus, and we got potassium. We got the same amount for nitrogen and phosphorus and then we need a lot more potassium on sweet potatoes than we do the other two. So only 1.4 pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet, which is not very much at all. No, and if you just got a hundred square feet, and I don't grow a lot of sweet potatoes because I normally can take a small area and produce a lot. If you're growing a hundred square feet, just simply move out over one and it'd be 0.14. That's right, that's right. So and when you think about something like sweet corn, which needs around five and a half pounds per thousand square foot, this doesn't need much nitrogen mm -hmm. at all. And that's why when I, you see my video, while I talk about how, uh, just that chicken manure compost is, is probably all the nitrogen you need. I, I doubt I'll supplement it with much That's nitrogen. That's exactly the, the, what I would do. Um, and then you got a little bit of phosphorus you need there. And then the potassium is the big kicker there. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a lot of people asking, so how do we get just potassium without these other things? You got any recommendations? Well, sure I do. There's such thing called sulfate of potash that you can buy, mm -hmm. the straight potassium. There's also murate of potash that you can buy that is straight potassium. And let's just say that you're more of a naturalist or organic type person. Mm -hmm. You can put wood ashes. Wood ashes is a good form of potash. So mm -hmm. if you got some wood ashes left over from your big grill or whatever like that, you could put them out there in your garden. That's a great source. It has to be hardwood because you can't use any soft wood such as pine or that. But all your charcoals are made out of hardwood. So char uh, charcoal ash is a perfect source for potassium. Okay, now think about that. Huh. So we need a lot more potassium than we do nitrogen and phosphorus. We need about four times as much. That's right, and I can tell you from experience, if you do put too much nitrogen on there, you ain't gonna make many taters. You're gonna make vine. You're gonna make vine, 
and you're going to be excited and you're going to get out there and think, ooh, I got a bumper crop. Mm -hmm. And you and you're just going to pull up vine and pull up vine yep. and not dig any taters. So don't be easy on that nitrogen because you can easily put now if you're not if you're not going to use chicken litter or good compost you, you're not don't have you're not privy to that and you have to use a synthetic the recommendation says to use uh ammonia nitrate for the nitrate for the nitrate ammonia nitrate has both ammonia and nitrate so it has two different sources of the nitrogen there and it says you use the prill part i've never bought an ammonia nitrate that wasn't prill yeah let's talk about when to um because just like with everything tomatoes or whatever you don't you're not giving this all to the plant at the same time so let's talk about when you want to administer these parts if you can do it now this is this is obviously kind of catered toward the commercial scale but we can we can take some lessons from here sure. and, and hopefully make a a better crop so this is uh based on recommendations from north carolina sweet potato growers and um, because it's a commercial scale, what, the way they recommend the applications is per cultivation. So when they cultivate them, they fold in the fertilizer. So on their first cultivation, which would be, you know, they recommend a few weeks after planting, um, you're going to give it all of the phosphate, so that whole 1.4 pounds per thousand square foot, and then half the potassium. And the reason for that is this phosphorus won't leave you. It's going to be there. The only way it's going to leave you if it's used up. And then when they say cultivation, I'm assuming they're talking about healing. That was what we were talking about. Healing, healing or just, uh, yeah, I guess folding yeah, in some. folding it in, raising it up, bedding it. Phosphorus you can put out there at any given time. You don't have to worry about the rain washing it away. You don't have to worry. When it's there, it's there. And the only way you can get it off from a spot is what they call farming it off. And that means you use it up through the plant. That's right. So in the first cultivation, hold this up, hold that one up. The first fertilization or cultivation, we're going to do half of this 4.5 and we're going to do all of this 1.4 phosphorus. And this is ideal situation. Um, and then the second cultivation, so straight potassium, we're going to do the other half of our potassium. So the other a little over two pounds. Potassium is soluble and moves into soil somewhat, but not near as much as what nitrogen does. Right. And then we're going to hold off on the nitrogen uh, based on these recommendations. You should hold off and do your nitrogen side dress last and do all your nitrogen at one time there. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand this might not be ideal with, the, you know, not a lot of people are going to be able to find a zero zero whatever fertilizer oh out yeah there. yeah you can find this it's available out there you may have to order it but it is available okay yeah yeah you can buy those those sulfates and marates of potash but um far if, if you got a farm i'm not like the track supply but if you actually got a farm supply place close by if they don't have it i'm sure they can get it for you okay so phosphorus potassium potassium and then nitrogen is the ideal fertilization cycle so let's just tables. go back for a minute and talk about if we was going if you do have access to some good compost or some good chicken litter, you would apply that pre-plant, mm -hmm. and then you would come back and hit it with your phosphorus, some additional phosphorus and some additional potassium. I'm not sure I would hit it again at the end with nitrogen, right? Because let's just take chicken litter for instance. It's normally about a three, 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 so it's pretty much even across there. You definitely going to need to hit it with some more potassium. But that nitrogen, that chicken litter is going to last, it's going to spike, and it's going to come back down, and it's going to spike there again with the release of it. So if you're using that, you're going to have to move the system around just a little bit. Still going to have to add some potassium there because we see right here how well potatoes love potassium. Yeah, I, I think I'll just take my um, charcoal dumpings from the grill and uh, yep. throw that, that out there, and we should be good to go. Uh, the other thing that they do mention about sweet potatoes is that they need those micronutrients and um boron in particular boron in particular and do you know any good way we can give them those uh, i believe i do so you give them some of this right here some of this wonderful micro boost that ought to do them just right because it's got your boron in it it's got all your other good micronutrients so micronutrients are important to sweet potatoes just like there are many other crops mm -hmm. out there. So, If you wanted to go organic on all this right here, we have a fish emulsion that would work too to get a lot of your nutrients to it. If you're 
concerned about using synthetic fertilizer, so there are other options out there. But the micro boost, you got to use that. That's right. Okay. And then uh, the last thing here I want to mention is just a few, you know, general questions people ask. Should I do this? Should I not do this? Uh, as far as growing on sweet potatoes on drip, I don't put mine on drip. You do. I have been known to overuse my drip if I have it, so it's one of those things where I just have to make myself not. I don't put it on there because I'll be prone to overwater them if I do. You better put it on one of this year. It's like it's going to be a dry year. My advice to you would be you use some drip. Well, if you use it, fine. If you don't, fine. But it's been, we ain't had a rain here in nearly over a month. Can you imagine trying to overhead water that stuff? Well, I got my little pots. I got a little tripod sprinkler that works yeah. perfect for them. So okay. I've been uh, I've been keeping the water to mind. We'll see. The second one is should you heal or shouldn't you heal sweet potatoes? Heal them babies and heal them babies some more. See, I, I'm not convinced that healing them necessarily makes more sweet potatoes, but I think it does provide some benefits to weed suppression in Absolutely. the middle of the road. Absolutely. Uh, yep. So it, it's not going to necessarily make a bigger crop because I don't think the commercial guys really heal them up really tall. Not really tall, but they do heal them. Um, but it is going to give you some in-row weed suppression there. And then the last thing is is to chop the vines in the middle of the row or to, to prune the vines. And I tested this last year, and it was mainly just to keep everything kind of neat uh, and trailing out everywhere and... Um, to make it easier when you harvest it. When you're harvesting sweet potatoes, half the battle's getting all them vines out of the way. It is. So I, what I did last year is I tilled the pathways on mine. It just chopped up the vines and made it more bushier in the middle of the row. I don't think it made any more sweet potatoes. It did make it look a little bit neater and made it easier to harvest. So you can you can prune the vines. If you got a plot you know, square plot like I got that's completely all sweet potatoes and they run out in the yard, run over the lawnmower. It ain't going to hurt anything to prune them and chop them up. Let's get in some questions. Let's do it. So B&B says, can you guys explain nematodes? What are they? What kind of soil they're in? And how much do they hurt crops? And how do you fix it? Okay. So let's, we got several different questions here within one question. Nematodes, what are they? Nematodes are microscopic roundworms, okay? Can't see them with the naked eye, they're there. What kind of soil they're in? They're in every soil. Nematodes are the most numerous organism on the planet. I like that, numerous. That means they're the most out there. Uh, well, I would say, not considering bacteria, the most numerous um, animal on the planet. How do they hurt crops? They can, um, you know, they get into roots there and they can damage um, the root system and affect the crops that way. And how do you fix it? You can grow, um, cover certain cover crops will take care of it. Mustard, sorghum, sedan grass, sun hemp will take care of it. You can also purchase beneficial nematodes and just having good soil health, having that balance to be able to fight off the bad ones. Or as we used to well. say back in the day, mask the symptoms. Mask the symptoms. That means you feed and have a good healthy plant and it outgrows it. Now the farmers back in the day, they used to use a the gas. They'd go in and gas the fields for nematodes, but they kind of got away from that a little bit. Some of these gases was pretty harmful and they're not around as popular as they used to be. So they've gone to different methods now. And, in, and we've found over the time with nematodes, Good practices, good soil practices is probably the best thing to do. Yeah. Um, so. Do you like the way I added to your answer? Sure, that sure. You're not going to get rid of them. They're everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, we just have to to uh, learn to appreciate that balance. And hopefully the beneficials outnumber the harmful ones. Oh, that's right. All right. Our second question comes from Larry Moore. And uh, Larry says, very interesting show. I have a question about cover crops. Other than helping the soil and preventing weed growth, what would, for example, buckwheat help produce in the garden? Pollinators. Pollinators? Wow. It's a huge, a huge. Man, we had pollinators. We had bees out there. I had bone bees. I had all kinds of things out there in my buckwheat the other day. I was amazed about it. A lot of people overthink these cover crops. The biggest thing is, is to learn that some of them, as long as you stay in that summer or winter, 
you're going to be okay. As long as you pick the ones for the summer that you grow this time of year or the ones for the winter. Some of them have different attributes than others do. Just go through there, pick out what you like, and go with it. I mean, we have one that's a legging, that's a nitrogen fixer that you can grow in the summertime. The buckwheat is absolutely wonderful for pollinators. Sedan buckwheat grass, also scavenges phosphorus. It does scavenge phosphorus. Sedan grass is not very good for pollinators, but it's great for biomass. Mm -hmm. So it's, oh, they all have their different benefits. And, and since we did that show last week, we had a lot of people calling or sending us emails asking which one should they plant. And this is the way I like to look at it, keep it simple. Think about how big a window you got, okay? If you're working with a smaller window like we are, where we're just looking for something between spring and we're going to go back to cash crops in fall, go with your buckwheat or your sun hemp, something quick. If, you, if you're not going to plant that garden area for another six months or maybe till next spring, if you just do a spring garden and you're done, Plant you something more long term, like your um, sorghum sedan or your millet. You can go in there and mow it, mm, whatever. Because right yep. if, if you're not going to use that area for six months, so you plant buckwheat, a month from now, you got to figure out something else to do. Yeah. So, uh, short window stuff, long windows, that's the way to think about it. All right. So, uh, if we answered your questions on the show, uh, send us an email to cussserve.com and we'll get you a nice little prize. And if you have any more questions about sweet potatoes or anything else we talked about on the show, put those in the comments and we will get to them next week. Hit that share button, hit that subscribe button, and we will see you guys next week. I got to go get me another bowl of corn. It's terrible stuff, ain't mm -hmm. it? See ya. <laughs>